If you know anything about the Old Testament, when they built this huge temple, God wasn't present in that until they began to pray. And when they started to pray, the presence of God was called the Shekinah glory in the Old Testament. The presence of God rushed into the temple and everybody felt the presence and holiness of God. And the temple is where everybody in the world went to to find God. So when Jesus came on earth, he became the temple. Right? He became the temple of God. And then when he went back to heaven, he says, you're going to become the temple. I'm going to have my spirit dwell in you like we did in the Old Testament, like it does in me. Okay, so your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Okay, again, no matter what, what we believe, that's kind of a foundational belief related to our sexual morality. Our bodies do not belong to us. When we were baptized, when we were confirmed, when we were received communion, we were given over to the Lord to be his temple. And so now, for a believer, our bodies need to glorify him. And that involves every area of our life. Not just in the area of sexuality, but in the area of how we eat and drink, how we exercise, how we rest. Are we glorifying God with our bodies? For you have been purchased at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Can we do the next slide here? So, I want to talk about chastity before we talk about homosexuality. We have about 10 minutes left, or 15, do huh? you have an idea? 15? Okay, give wrong things. Okay. What does chastity mean? Is that a good word or a bad word to you? Depends on which side of the drawn, right? Okay. But listen to this definition because I, I really think there's pieces of this that are really important for us to understand before we talk about homosexuality. The chaste person maintains the integrity of the powers of life and love. What does integrity mean? It means it's together, not torn apart. Right? It's one, not separated. So God made our sexuality to be both an expression of love and expression of life. And the church teaches when those two things are separated, when the capacity to love and the capacity to bring life are separated, that's sin. And that's division, that's disintegration. This integrity ensures the unity of the person. It is opposed to any behavior that would impair it. It tolerates neither a double life nor duplicity in speech. So it's not just how we act, it's also how we talk, how we speak, that says whether we're being chased or not. That includes what we believe and what we profess and how we, how we communicate the truth to other people. So if we're on the wrong side of the teaching of the church, the reality is we're lacking integrity. Can you, can you hear that? We're lacking integrity because it's not true in love inside of us. And so what's happened is we're filled with a culture that lacks integrity and there's all kind of confusion. There's all kind of, there's all kind of division internally. And I can tell you that every person that I've ever worked with Who's, who has same-sex attraction, feels the pain of this broken integrity. They know there's something that isn't whole, that isn't free, that isn't ordered in the right direction, and that's the pain. So we don't condemn the person for the lack of an integration. We help people become integrated. That's what compassion does. So, next one. Okay, so this is uh, looking at the church's teaching on homosexuality. This is Catechism 2357, if you want to write it down and go look at it at home. Basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as gr acts of grave depravity. Now that one doesn't fly very well in our culture. 
What does grave gravity mean? Grave is what we associate with death, right? What's depravity? You know what the definition of depravity is? It's, it's deprived of, right? But, but even another degree from that. Tradition has always declared, and this is for 4,000 years at least, Judeo-Christian belief system, 4,000 years compared to the last 30 years in, the, in our culture, okay? Just kind of measure those against each other. For 4,000 years, the culture, the Judeo-Christian culture generally believed this. In the last 30 years, a segment of our culture has said, no, that's not the truth, this is the truth. Which one do you think is right? Tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. Intrinsically disordered, which means they lack integration of love and life. Are we condemning the culture? No. We're speaking the truth in love. What does it mean that it's intrinsically disordered? Well, one of the things that John Paul II and the theology of the body, how many people have heard about the theology of the body? A lot more, okay. One of the things that John Paul II said in the theology of the body is our body is a prophet. The question is, is it a true prophet or a false prophet? Can you come up here for a second? Okay. One be on one side, one be on the other? Okay. Let's just say you're the false prophet or something. Okay. You're the true prophet. Okay. Is that okay? Right. So, if he's the false prophet and she's the true prophet, I'll just take another issue not, not related to, to homosexuality. Let's take the issue of abortion. Okay? And I'm not, I'm not pr uh, promoting this to either one of you, but let's say you become pregnant. Okay? And, <laughs> and you want her to get an abortion. Okay? As she becomes pregnant, what does her body communicate about the reality of this baby in her? If you just listen to the language of her body, what does it say? What's her relationship to the baby? Does she look like a uh, somebody who killed her baby. Okay? Does she look like somebody who treated like it wasn't a baby? That would be being a false prophet. Okay? But because the womb is supposed to be the most sacred and protected place in all of the universe, the place of greatest communion, her body communicates a reality that she has to deny and suppress in order to have an abortion. Do you, you understand what I'm saying there? Okay? Her body communicates a reality that she has to deny and negate in order to, to suppress the truth. This is how St. Paul talks about sin. We suppress the truth. Because he doesn't have a womb, thank God. He doesn't know what it's like to carry a baby inside of him. Neither do I. Okay? He doesn't know about the incredible intimacy and tenderness and affection and protection that a mother has. So he can stand outside and say, this is inconvenient, this is messing my life up, you just need to get an abortion. But that would be being a false prophet because that's not what his body said. That's assuming that they made this baby together. <laughs> Can you see how his body then becomes a false prophet? Because the very act of making the baby was supposedly an act of love, even though it wasn't fully love if it was done outside of marriage. It wasn't love at all if it was done outside of marriage. But let's take the issue with, with same-sex attraction. Okay? And that's what it would get back to this point about gravely disordered. Just, and again, I don't want to get too personal here, but how is her body made? Is her, is her body made to match a woman's body sexually? No. I mean, isn't it obvious 
that her body isn't made for a woman's body to match it. I, mean, that's, I, I think this is what really is amazing in our culture, that we could be this blind to the most basic reality. Okay. Even if she had desires, those desires are disordered according to the order of how God made her. Now let's just suppose for a second that he's not only confused, again, false prophet over here, he's not only confused, but like Bruce Jenner, who became Caitlyn Jenner, okay, but believing inside of himself that he's a woman when outside he's a man. Doesn't that confusion just, I mean, I used to watch Bruce Jenner in the Olympics. He was, a, he was an incredible decathlete. And now to see him as a, a woman is just very confusing because I can, he's not a woman. Even if he cut off all of his sexual parts, he'd still be a man genetically. But inside he feels like a woman. So, again, this isn't you, but let's say Bruce Jenner in his body becomes a false prophet. Because his body speaks one reality and his mouth speaks another and his mind speaks another. It's a disorder. It doesn't mean that he's a bad person. It means he's a confused person. Okay, and it won't get into how that all started. But can you see that even in a different way, if if his body is attracted to a male, that his body doesn't fit with a male body. There's no way a baby's going to come from those two male bodies together or two female bodies together. When you break the integrity of love and life, you've become disordered. Does that make sense to you? Okay. To me, every little child knows that truth, but somehow when we get to be adults and we get all this education in our culture, we somehow suppress the truth. So how do we live chastity? We live chastity in every area of our life by being a true prophet. And if we recognize that we've been a false prophet, we begin to integrate those areas in our life that are in conflict with one another. So that we bring that back together. Go ahead. Thanks. And, and you can be true prophet again. Thank you. <laughs> Just to finish this, five more minutes we have? Five? Okay. So, they, homosexual acts, are contrary to the natural law. Do you know what the natural law is? That's what we just described. It's how God made us. It's like it's apparent to everybody what our nature looks like and what our nature does. So it's contrary to the natural law. They close the sexual act to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a genuine affective and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstances can they be approved. Is the church being harsh? No. The church, church is being as gentle as it possibly can to lead people away from what's going to destroy them into what's truth, into what's love. Because what the world calls love is not love. There may be aspects of love, but it's not true love. One more, if we can. One more slide. Okay. Uh, no, back? Okay. The number of men and women who have deep-seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible. There's an estimate of it, somewhere between 2 and 3% of the population. Okay? So it's not negligible. It's in the hundreds of thousands. This inclination, which is objectively disordered, constitutes for most of them a trial. This is where the church has made a lot of mistakes over the years and standing for the truth without love. You have no idea until you've walked with somebody who struggled in this area, the tremendous trial of feeling like I'm different, I don't belong, my desires aren't normal, what's wrong with me, and I have to hide who I am. That's a tremendous trial that requires our compassion. It requires us to help in the process of integrating and supporting, not in condemning or judging or, or making uh, some kind of a, 
of the separation. They must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. I would say the reason why, as a culture, one of the reasons why, as a culture, that we have the problems we do related to this whole issue is because of how poorly the church and the culture has loved people with same-sex attraction. The whole thing about coming out of the closet was living in that trial in secrecy, looking to find other people who would understand. So if we, as the body of Christ, aren't that support system, then the gay community becomes that support system. And the gay community then just reinforces the lie, just continues the suppression of the truth in unrighteousness. So, again, to bring this all back together, love and truth have to be married at every point. Otherwise, we get into disorder, condemnation, false false love. And as a church, we need to be the representation of Jesus, who sometimes in the cross communicates the truth and love with God's mercy in that way. So, thanks to the two of you.